This is a reading from the novel The Testing by Joel Charbonneau, Chapter 5. Now that I've started, the words rush out of me. My father's missing memories, his fragmented nightmares, the belief that our former teachers shared the same nightmares and used her authority to prevent Five Lake students from being selected for the testing. I hold my breath and wait for Thomas to condemn my father's ideas, to tell me that we will be safe. This is only a test like all the others we've taken in our lives. Instead, he says, it's a good thing we're in the same group. Will we be able to look out for each other? You think my father's nightmares are real memories? I think it's a good idea to prepare for whatever might be coming. If they aren't real, then we won't be any worse off for keeping alert. If they are, his fingers lace with mine and we sit there as the unfinished words hang between us. A whistle makes us jump. Michael is waving. He's ready to leave. Thomas scrambles to his feet and helps me up. He doesn't let go of my hand as we trek back through the tall grass. Halfway to the skimmer, he stops and pulls something wrapped in a white cotton handkerchief out of his pocket. Cookies. He takes one and offers me the other. Since we're partners, the word makes me smile. Partners, as we have been so many times before. Every time we worked together, we scored the highest marks in the class. I find myself hoping this will be the same. Well, partner, I say taking the cookie. Make sure you turn don't make sure you turn down any cookies offered you by from our competition, just in case. As expected, Zandri looks annoyed when she sees Thomas and me climb into the skimmer together. While Thomas might not be concerned with Zandri, it is clear by the daggers she's shooting me that she doesn't feel the same. In fact, my partnership with Thomas might have just netted me a new adversary. Perhaps not as dangerous as those who would poison my food to get ahead but still worrisome considering the length of our fingernails. Thomas heads to the back of the skimmer to sit with the other two. A hand touches my arm as I start to join them. Everything okay? Michael's eyes are filled with concern. I smile and am fully aware of the camera as I say, Everything's great. It was just nice to see the revitalization work up close. My father would be impressed. He glances back towards the camera, then each returns with my smile. The concern in his face is gone, replaced by pleasure. Yes, for some reason, out of the four of us from Five Lakes Colony, Michael has decided to help me, and clearly he believes I have performed well. Telling me to take a seat, Michael climbs into the driver's compartment. Zandri is busy talking to Thomas about some party they both attended a few weeks ago as I sink into one of the couches at the end and feel the skimmer begin to move. She fingers her bracelet, a square with a stylized flower in the middle. As she leans forward, drawing attention to the loose neckline of her blouse, I don't know if the people watching us are annoyed by Zandri's flirting, but I am. And worse, I'm certain her antics don't reflect well on her academic standing, considering her reluctance to attend in the first place. I wait for an opening and ask Zandri about the new windmill she had hand desi- that she had a hand in designing. While her primary passion is painting, Zandri has a wonderful eye for symmetry and balance that her town's architect has been happy to utilize. I'm betting her bracelet design has something to do with this skill. Zandri gives me a curious glance, probably because I was, hope- I was also involved in the project, but doesn't dismiss the opportunity to talk about herself. Thomas asks her questions about the windmill and pulls Malachi into talking about the things he's been working on. For the next hour, Thomas and I trade off interviewing our fellow candidates, helping them look good in front of the Invisible Testing Committee. They are my competition, but because they are from home, I will do what I can to keep us all safe. The conversation tapers off, and I find myself fighting to keep my eyes open after such a long day. Why don't you get some sleep? Thomas slides into the seat next to me and gives me a warm smile. I'll wake you if anything exciting happens. I follow his advice and stretch out to the cushions near the front of the cabin. I'm not sure how well I'll sleep knowing Thomas might see me drool, but I close my eyes and give it a try. The last thing I hear before the real world fades is Thomas telling Xandri and Malachi to speak softly. My father talks to me in my dreams, the dad I knew before I was selected. He patiently shows me how to splice flora genes, holds my hands while I attempt to mimic his movements tells me the biggest failures typically come before the biggest breakthroughs, that no matter what, I should never get discouraged. Learn from my mistakes, and all will be well. Sia, wake up. My father's hands shake me. No, not my father, Thomas. 
I'm no longer home. Thomas smiles as I open my eyes. Get up. Michael says you don't want to miss this. Michael's right. Out of the window, I can see the shimmering, impossibly clear body of water. The dimming light cannot detract from its obvious purity. The five great lakes of our colony is named after have been cleansed, but not like this. Not yet. The sight takes my breath away. And then I see it, what the others are watching with shining eyes and open mouths, up ahead, beyond the water, silver buildings, lights bright enough to be seen for miles and miles. These can only mean one thing, Tosu City, we're here. In school, we've been taught that 99 years ago, Tosu City was created as the first tangible sign that we as a people had survived the seven stages of war. The four stages of destruction that humans wrought on one another and then the following three stages in which the earth fought, but fought back. This spot was chosen because its predecessor was deemed an unimportant military target by the wagers of war. While it would not escape the corruption of the earth or the earthquakes, tornadoes and floods, much of the city still stood when the earth quieted and those left alive began to rebuild. As we move closer, the building seemed to grow taller. How thrilling and scary it must be to view the world from the top. Some buildings aren't as tall, but the squat, perfectly cylindrical shapes and constructed of steel and glass are no less impressive. Building after building after building, I cannot tell how many of them are new or which survive these wars. The buildings begin to blur together and everywhere there are people, walking, running, laughing, hurrying, skimmers and bicycles crowd the streets, old-fashioned cars and glide scooters. Most streets we pass look neat, clean and new, exactly what I expect from the city that serves the center of our country's hope for the future. But as we travel, I catch a glimpse of other streets that are dirtier and in disrepair. The people walking to and from those areas look worn out and tired. Some appear hungry, others look as though they haven't bathed in weeks, and I wonder why. From school, I know the greatest concentration of our population is here, in this city, at least 100,000 people. Until this moment, I never fully understood what the number meant. Now that I do, I'm overwhelmed. I feel Thomas's hand slip into mine and hold it on tight. His face is pale, his eyes are wide. I think I'm not allowed uh, I think I'm not alone in my feelings of insignificance and confusion. Michael tells us we'll go immediately to the testing facilities. No sightseeing will be allowed. But I notice he takes us past the towering Capitol building and the cold stone department of justice. Both places Malachi expressed interest in seeing before steering the skimmer through the large arch arch arching gate. A wrought iron sign next to the arch reads the University of the United Commonwealth. My heart skips. We are at the university. Here I can tell the buildings are old, red brick, white trim, a clock tower. Some buildings made of glass, others of stone. All speak of age and of wisdom. I see a large sculpture of two hands clasping each other. In prayer, in hope, Zandri might know, but I don't want to ask her. I just want to take it all in. We pass a large stadium and moments later the skimmer slows. It comes to a stop in front of a massive sleek building made of black steel and black glass. The grounds around it are lush and green and filled with flowers, but they in no way soften the stark imposing exterior. A small bronze sign in front of the entrance reads, Testing Center. The skimmer door opens and our four of us hop out. I look up at the tall structure and then at the heavy steel front door and my stomach clenches. I feel a large warm hand touch my shoulder. Thomas. Just knowing he is beside me helps me the gnawing panic at bay. Here, Michael hands me the bag marked with my symbol. Make sure you don't let it out of your sight, he says this in a low, quiet voice. His gaze locks with mine. There is no smile or amusement in his eyes. He is serious. I am to keep my few possessions with me no matter what. Then, the moment is gone. Michael turns back and his voice booms out. Once we get inside, you'll be assigned your sleeping quarters and your roommates. Most of the other candidates are already here since their skimmers didn't have mechanical problems. The last few will arrive sometime tonight. He gives us a big smile and asks, are you ready to go inside? There's only one acceptable answer. Yes, we all give it. Michael nods and presses six buttons on a small keypad next to the door. There is the click. 
The door swings open and we follow Michael inside. Thomas is the last to cross the threshold. The minute he does, the door swings shut behind him. The sound of the locks begin being engaged accompanies our first glimpse of the testing center, which, to be completely honest, is kind of a letdown. The lobby area is dimly lit. White walls with a scuffed gray floor, two gray wooden chairs are arranged in the corner to suggest a conversational gathering place, but the chairs look as though they've never been used. We don't get to use them now because Michael is leading us down a long white and gray hallway to a bank of elevators. I've never been in one, but I've read about them, studied how they work. The doors open the minute Michael presses a button and we all step in. Whoosh. In a matter of seconds, the numbers over the doors have gone from one to five. The elevator dings and the door slides open to reveal a large, electrically lit lobby with shiny white tile floors. The side walls are painted blue, but the back wall is all glass, giving us a view of a large room beyond filled with tables, chairs, and people. People our age. My heart lurches. Dozens and dozens of other testing candidates. The sound of a throat clearing brings my attention to an overly large woman with long curly white hair and round gold rimmed glasses seated behind a large wooden desk. She gives us a smile and stands. The woman begins to speak and I relax. Her voice is warm and friendly as she welcomes us to Tosu City and congratulates us on being chosen for the testing. Most of the other candidates arrived yesterday or earlier today. Dinner is being served in the hall behind me. You can freshen up and leave your things in your rooms, or you can just go straight in. I'd like to go straight in, I say. If I am shown to my room, I might never have the courage to come out. Xandri looks like she wants to fight about it, but Thomas agrees with me, and that settles the issue. Michael gives me a subtle nod and leads us down the corridor, through a door, and into the large hall. We saw through the glass. I don't think I'm imagining it when I hear the room go silent. All eyes dart to us taken our faces, sizes up as competition. Then the talking and eating resume. On the left side of the hall is a buffet type table piled with food. Three servers stand behind the table as though ready to explain the choices. Several types of bread, apples, oranges, and grapes, a red stew made with lots of vegetables and beef, carrots and tiny onions in a light sauce, and thick steaks of some kind of fish I've never seen before. Michael tells me the fish is called salmon. There's a separate table filled with cakes and other sweets. Grab a plate, eat as much as you want, as if to demonstrate he follows his own advice. The four of us grab our own plates and make our selections. I take a roll filled with raisins and nuts, a small piece of salmon, an apple, and some of the carrots. Just what I can eat. But I can see other candidates do not follow the same rule. Many have more than one plate in front of them, piled with food. Some are taking the taste of one thing, then pushing it away in favor of something better. My father taught me to respect the food we grow and the neighbors we share our food resources with. The idea of blatantly wasting what has taken years to make, grow, and thrive makes me lose my appetite. The tables closest to us are all filled with candidates. They eye us as we walk down the aisle to an empty table in the back. I put my plate down and turn in time to see a large scruffy boy with mean eyes stick his leg out in front of Malachi. Malachi loses a hold of his plate, which crashes to the ground. Were it not for Thomas's quick reflexes, Malachi would be face first in stew. Despite Malachi's dark skin, I can see the embarrassment burning on his cheeks. He mumbles an apology and starts to clean up the mess, but Michael stops him. This wasn't your fault. His eyes flick to the scruffy boy who is busy shoving cake in his smirking mouth. Why don't you take my plate? While well, I find someone to clean this up. Malachi takes the plate and slides into a chair with his eyes cast down. His shame at causing an undignified scene is almost palpable. And I find my hands curling into fists. Rage, white and hot, burns in my blood. My family is close to encourage discussion to resolve differences, but I have four older brothers. When pushed, I know how to fight. I'm ready to do so now. Sia, your food is getting cold. Thomas's voice reaches me through the rage. The mild words hold a warning. We are being watched. Every move counts. Save my fight for later. I feel my emotions deflate as I uncurl my hands, sit with, the comp sit with my companions, and pick up my fork. Thomas nudges Malachi and whispers in his ear whatever he says knocks Malachi out of his stupper. He picks up his fork and starts the shoveling in food. 
Michael returns with another plate and keeps a steady stream of conversation going while we eat. In the silences, I hear people from other tables talking about us, wondering what colony we are. Someone speculates that we are from Five Lakes, but that gets a shot down with lots of laughter. Five Lakes colony is a joke to them. The knot of worry in my stomach grows. I finish everything but the apple. The salmon must have tasted good, but I wasn't paying attention to the flavors. Another group of six candidates arrive and takes a table in the back. They hurry to eat as the rest of our plates are cleaned away by a woman in white jumpsuits. Then a voice begins to talk. Welcome to Tosu City and congratulations on being chosen for the testing. It takes me a minute to find who is speaking since the sound of being is being broadcast from speakers positioned in every corner of the room. Through the glass window, I can see the woman who greeted us holding a microphone in her hand. 108 of you have assembled to be tested. At most, 20 will pass through to attend the university. I wish you all luck in being one of those who will pass. Less than a one in five chance, voices murmur around us, some confident and cocky, others surprised at the number, but trying hard not to sound worried. The voice over the speaker continues. Since everyone has arrived, tomorrow morning will mark the beginning of the testing process. In 10 minutes, you will report to your design sleeping quarters. If you haven't been assigned a room, please ask your travel escort and he or she will get the assignment for you. I advise you to get as much rest as you can to help you in the days and weeks ahead. Good night and best of luck. Michael presses a slip of paper with my room assignment into my hand and holds his there for several seconds longer than necessary. In his eyes, in the squeeze of his hands, I know he is wishing me luck. Then he is gone. We head out to the dining hall and split up. Girls to the right, boys to the left. Zandri and I watch Malachi and Thomas disappear down the hall. Then together we look for our rooms. I'm in room 34. Zandri is in room 28. As she's about to go inside, I give her a hug. Who knows what tomorrow might hold? I want her to do well. Surprisingly, she tightens her arms around me, and we stand like that for a moment, bonded by years of shared experiences and the fear of what is to come. When we step back from each other, she smiles. Give him hell tomorrow, you hear? I nod. You too. She disappears into her room, and I go in search of number 34. I find a few doors down. Someone is moving around inside. Taking a deep breath, I turn the handle on the heavy wooden door and push. Hi! The room is large, filled with two big beds, two desks, and some chairs. It takes me a minute to spot the source of the wispy voice. When I do, I'm surprised to see it belong to a tall, beautiful girl with broad shoulders and a long blonde hair. She gives me a shy smile. I'm Remy from Dixon Colony. I'm guessing you're, we're rooming together. I nod and take several steps into the room. The door clicks and shut behind me. I'm Sia from Five Lakes. Her lips spread into a delighted smile. That's amazing. Everyone at dinner was talking about Five Lakes and saying how no one from there has been tested in years. They thought it might meant the colony died or failed or something. Five Lakes is still around. We're just a small compared to the other colonies. Dixon is small too. She sits on the bed against the far wall and curls her legs up and around under her. We only have about 15,000 people, so it was really exciting when eight of us were chosen this year. Her smile is warm, and I find myself smiling back, taking a seat on the other bed. I say, 15,000 is big to me. Five lakes is just under 1,000. How many of you are here? Four, a quarter of our class. She asks about five lakes, where we are located, what kinds of foods we grow, what kinds of animals frequent the area. From what she says about her own colony, it sounds like Dixon is about 300 miles southwest of Five Lakes. While her colony is larger, its resources aren't as developed. Maybe with so many people, it's just harder to stretch the resources they have, or maybe it's because a large part of their adult population works on creating batteries and electrical supplies instead of developing the land. Since Remy's family runs a farm, they aren't hungry, but many in the nearby town are. Remy says that compensation money her parents will receive is going to be used for more farming and food storage equipment. Both will add to the food resources for her family and those around them. Remy sounds proud to have a hand in providing those things to her community. Even though I planned on keeping my distance from candidates from outside my colony, I find myself liking her. We talk on and off the next hour. Remy shows me the design on her bracelet, a triangle with a decorative looking A in the middle not my group. 
She offers to help me unpack, but I tell her I'm keeping everything in my bag. Who knows when the testing might come to an end for any of us. She smiles and agrees, although I can see two billowy dresses hanging in the closet in front of, in front of her bed. My mother would approve of the impression Remy's clothes will make. We both use the small bathroom adjoining our sleeping quarters, change into our pajamas, and climb into our beds. Remy asks if we can keep the lights on for a while. She is sitting cross-legged, flipping through a photo album she brought from home. The tears in her eyes tug at my heart, reminding me that I, too, left my family behind. That if this was any other night, my mother would be sitting in front of the fire, asking about my day. My father would be brainstorming ideas with my brothers while we played cards around the kitchen table. Swallowing down the wave of homesickness, I tell Remy to leave the lights on as long as she wants before I curl up under the covers. She thanks me. I'm about to close my eyes when she adds, If you get hungry, I brought some corn cakes from home. I made them myself. Help yourself. I sleep with my bag tucked in beside me. My dreams are troubled. And although I can't remember them when I wake to a voice over a loudspeaker telling us that we have an hour to get dressed and eat before the fa first phase of the testing begins, I pull on a pair of dark brown pants, an off-white tunic, and my boots. Then I fold my night clothes and the pants and top I wore yesterday and shove them in my bag. Remy raises an eyebrow at my repacking but doesn't say anything. She's wearing a flowery buttercup yellow dress and a shiny white slippers. She's even added touches of lip stain and eye makeup. Across the room, I can hear her stomach growling, but I notice she doesn't touch the corn cakes. Maybe I'm paranoid, but I do a quick count. There are nine of them. If there are still nine after today, I'll know for certain not to trust Remy with my possessions or my secrets. I twist the bracelet around my wrist, then check my bag one last time and hoist everything over my shoulder. Remy walks with me down to the dining hall, ignoring invitations from others to join them. I'm not sure why she wants to stick with me, but I'm guessing she's curious about the rest of the Five Lakes Colony candidates. From the way she was talking last night, it sounds like the other colonies have some communication with one another. Five Lakes is truly the unknown. I fill a plate with strawberries, orange melon, a roll with smells spicy and sweet, and two strips of crisp bacon. Remy kids me about the nerves zapping my appetite while she piles a plate high with pancakes, waffles, eggs, sausage, and fried potatoes. We each grab a glass of milk and I look around for my Five Lakes compatriots. They are at the same table we occupied yesterday, along with a few new unfamiliar faces. I am not the only one who has picked up a passenger. Malachi and Zandri introduced us to their roommates, Boyd and Nicolette. Both have dark hair, brown eyes, and tan skin. I'm not surprised to learn that they are from the same colony to the east and south, Pine Bluff. Boyd is in Zandri's group. I can't see Nicolette's bracelet very well. Her dress has long flimsy sleeves that keep fluttering over it. Something with a heart. I think I slide in the next to Thomas, who is the only other Five Lakes candidate with his, with his bag in tow. Although I notice at least a third of the candidates, including the two additions to our table, have theirs with them. Letting the chatter swirl around me, I take a small bite out of the sweet fruit and try not to think about what is coming. If what I have learned thus far isn't enough, there is nothing I can do to change that. By the time I've finished my breakfast, I've learned that Nicolette and Boyd are cousins. Their two families operate a rice farm and have been struggling with their, uh, with their water management system. Rice is a crop I have never eaten and I know next to nothing about. Thomas is unfamiliar with it as well but hearing them talk about irrigation issues is enough to start a lively discussion. I even have a few ideas to add to the mix that Boyd thinks are for use. We are having such an interesting conversation that I forget my anxiety until a voice announces, testing candidates, please report to the elevator banks where the officials will direct you to your first round of tests. Best of luck. My heart swoops into my stomach, unsettling my breakfast. A hand takes mine and holds fast. I turn and look up into Thomas's eyes. Is he nervous? I can't tell, but I'm glad for the warmth and steadiness of his hand as I rise to my feet. Almost every girl is wearing her prettiest dress and her most polished and scuff-free shoes. I would feel out of place in my wardrobe if not for Thomas standing next to me. His black boots are worn, his cotton shirt is brown, pants are fading, faded. Regardless of what test they throw at us, I can almost guarantee you that Thomas and I will be the mo only comfortable ones taking them. Testing officials in dark purple and deep red jumpsuits herd us into two elevator cars and direct us to the third floor. 
Thomas tightens his grip on my hand as we stand in the back of the small silver room and descend two floors. Some of the other candidates give Thomas and I my joined hands a knowing look, and I start to pull away. But Thomas won't let me. I don't know why he has singled me out for his attention and support, but a small, terrified part of me is glad for it. Partners, he called us, a word that doesn't begin to account for the bubbles of anxiety that have nothing to do with the tests and everything to do with the way my hand feels in his. The elevator doors open and we are greeted by more officials. It occurs to me that they are dressed in formal colors to announce their st that announce their status. They are making it clear that they are adults. They are in charge. We are directed into a large room filled with seats and a stage. The lights on the stage are bright, illuminating a gray-haired, bearded man wearing a purple jumpsuit. He holds a microphone in his hand and is clearly waiting for us to be seated. Hands linked, Thomas and I slide into the seats in the back. We look for Zandri and Malachi, but don't see them. The last two students sit. The testing officials from the hallway come into the room and assume standing positions in the aisles. Finally, the man in front of us begins to speak. Welcome to Tosu City. My name is Dr. Jedediah Barnes. I speak for myself and all of my colleagues when I say we are honored to have you here. His smile and voice are warm. You are here because you are the best and the brightest. On your shoulders rest the hopes of everyone in the United Commonwealth. Here among you are the future leaders of our country. All leaders must be tested, which is the process that you will begin today. People fidget in their seats. Nerves, excitement, I admit I feel a combination of both. The man smiles again. The testing process consists of four parts. Over the next two days, you will sit for the written exams. These will test your knowledge of history, science, mathematics, and reading, as well as give us an idea of your logic and problem-solving skills. After these tests are evaluated, we will make our first cuts. The tension in the room ratchets up a couple notches. I tighten my hold on Thomas's hand, which has to be uncomfortable for him, but he doesn't complain. Part two is a series of hands-on examinations that will allow you to demonstrate your ability to transfer intellectual knowledge into practical use. Those who pass will be asked to participate in part three, an examination that will test your ability to work in teams and assess your teammates' strengths and weaknesses. Finally, part four will test your decision-making and leadership abilities. Those who get high marks in all four sections of the testing will then have a one-on-one -on -one evaluation with the selection committee. This final personality and psychological evaluation will help us determine who will move on to the university where you will join the other outstanding minds to help restore the land and our country, both to their former glory. This is a lofty goal, but from what I'm hearing about this class of candidates, especially those from colonies we haven't seen in years, I'm certain you can achieve it. I see students in the rows in front of us looking around. For Malachi and Zandri, for me and Thomas, my roommate said everyone was interested in us because it was speculated that Five Lakes Colony was long dead. She would have mentioned if the other colonies had been absent from the testing. By singling, by singling us out, Dr. Barnes has most likely painted targets on our backs. Was it intentional? The polished quality of his speech tells me it was. Does he want to encourage other students to trip us? Or is he leveling the field so others will not overlook us as teammates later? Dr. Barnes hands the microphone off to a willowy woman whose red jumpsuit clashes with her bright orange hair. She introduces herself as Professor Verna Holt and says, You will now be taken to your testing rooms. All candidates have been assigned a group based on their previous academic successes. The group you belong to is represented by the large symbol on your identification bracelet. When you see the symbol of your group on the screen behind me, please join the other members by the elevator banks. A testing official will meet you and escort you to your testing room. I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors and look forward to working with you in the days and weeks ahead. There is a hum of a motor and a large white screen unfurls above the stage. A black heart symbol flashes. You can hear people murmur as the symbol registers. Their time has come. I see Nicolette Trump up the aisle and disappear out the door with the 20 or so members of her group. Several minutes pass. A few whispers, I hold my breath, waiting for the next group to be called. A triangle, Malachi and Remy. I spot Malachi, small, slight body, rise from the seat to our far left. His mouth is pursed with concentration or fear as he walks up the aisle. 
I give him a thumbs up, but his eyes are plastered on the back of a girl in front of him, and he doesn't notice. There are a few whispers, more fidgeting, as we wait. My heart keeps pace with the seconds ticking by. The screen flickers, another symbol, mine. Thomas sucks in air, as I remember, ours. Though I am certain he will outdistance all of us on the test, I am so glad he's coming with me. He is a touchstone from home. I will do better knowing he is near. We rise and join the others in our group. I can't help but notice that our group is much smaller than the others. Once we are in the hallway, I count ten, half the size. Is this good or bad? The two testing officials in their red and purple do not allow me the time to worry further. The blonde asks us to follow her. She heads down the hallway to the left and we follow. A dark haired man brings up the rear. The woman at the door instructs us to step inside and take a seat at one of the desks. The door is narrow. Thomas goes first. I enter next. Two steps inside and I stop walking. My feet are planted on the floor. As bile comes up, climbs up my throat. I know this room. White walls, white floors black desks. This is the testing room, my father's, of my father's nightmares. So that was chapter five of The Testing by Joel Charbonneau, pages 59 to 78 to those of you reading in the book.